Father, as we come to your word again today, we thank you that we can come together in fellowship. We thank you that we can hear your word together. We thank you that the preaching of your word is paramount in the gathering of your people. Lord, we thank you, Lord, that, we, that in your word we, we get a glimpse of who you are. Lord, you are proclaimed before us. And what a God is proclaimed. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Three in one and one in three. A God who is slow to anger and full of tender mercies and compassion. A God of forgiveness. A God of righteousness. A God of true holiness and beauty. And Lord, we come before this God to hear you speak to us today. And we ask, Lord, that you would just cleanse us. Lord, we recognise that all of us this week have done things and thought things and said things that we should not have done and said and thought. Lord, sometimes we've not done things we should have done. So Lord, we come before you and ask that you would cleanse us, Lord, from all sin. We thank you that, Lord, that avenue is given to us because we are part of your family. And Lord, you desire us to come honestly before you. So we come, we confess our sin, and Lord, once again, we receive cleansing and forgiveness. Lord, we thank you that, Lord, your Holy, Spirit, your Holy Spirit brings us the joy of our salvation, the assurance of our faith. And we thank you, Lord, for the process of being conformed to the image of Christ. Lord, that process that began when we trusted in you for the first time and will continue, Lord, until the day when Jesus is revealed. Father, we thank you for all this. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Turn with me, if you have a Bible, to Mark and chapter 10. It's going to be a long sermon, so I hope you, I hope you haven't got anything cooking at home. I'm joking. It might be a long sermon, actually, but it's not, but, you know, uh, it's too hot to cook anything anyway, isn't it? <laughs> we return today, of course, to our study of the gospel according to... So Mark, if you're interested uh, in catching up, if you've missed any of these, then they're available on our YouTube channel uh, as, as we put up our edited versions of our worship on a Sunday. So you can catch up on, well, I won't say you'll be able to catch up on all of them, but you can catch up on most of them. But we return, of course, to Mark chapter, Mark chapter 10. And interestingly enough, we come to what I think is one of the, one of the hardest and probably most misunderstood text in the whole of Scripture. In this text, we find a particular saying of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I don't know what you think the hard things that Jesus asks you to do are. It might be hard for you to love your enemies. Jesus certainly says that to us, doesn't he? <coughs> it might be hard for you to bless those who persecute you. That's pretty tough, isn't it? It might be, you might find it hard to deny yourself, to take up your cross and follow him. That's pretty tough, isn't it? That's difficult, that's not easy for any of us to do. You might, you might think some of the other sayings of Jesus are particularly hard. He's called to humility. He's called to lay down your life. He's called, he's called even to be chaste in this generation where sensuality is you know, placarded all around us in terms of the media. That could be the hardest thing. Well, actually, I think here in chapter 10, verses 13 through 16, we have something that, if we understand it, is actually even harder than all those things. This is the, the word of the Lord. And they were bringing children to him, that he might touch them. And the disciples rebuked them. But when Jesus saw it, he was indignant and said to them, let the children come to me. Do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of God. Truly I say to you, Whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. And he took them 
in his arms and blessed them, laying his hands upon them. Before we uh, speak into of these verses, and because of the short interval we've had in our study, I want to remind us of a couple of the things that will help us navigate this section of this gospel account. I want to remind you first of all of the nature of this gospel, this account of the life and the ministry and the significance of Jesus. And let me tell you that, that, that any account, any of the four accounts of the gospel of Jesus are the most important things I think that have ever been written. I don't know what you think is important. <coughs> you know, it might be it might be something. To, you know, it might be a car manual. It might be something to do with your work. It might be a, a medical a medical book. It might be a, a you know a, a manual of some description. But the accounts of Jesus are absolutely without parallel in terms of their importance to men and women and boys and girls. And Mark's purpose in his account of Jesus is to demonstrate to his readers, and that includes you today, to demonstrate to you and to you and to me that this Jesus of Nazareth, he and he alone is the Messiah. He is the Christ. He is the anointed Saviour. He is the incarnate Son of God. That's what Mark is telling us. He wants to tell us that it's this Jesus who came to the earth, who served, who suffered, and who died, and on the third day, rose again. And he rose again, Mark says, for the salvation of all who will trust him. I'm tempted to go on a little bit of a diversion. In fact, I'm going to, because I'm preaching, and I can do what I want. Well, I can't really, because the elders will throw me out. You know, one of the sad things about going to my sister's funeral, uh, my sister's funeral, my niece's funeral, with all, the, with all the nicety of the church, and it was a lovely building, and with all the, the nice words that were spoken, I was sad that there wasn't much gospel. Or the gospel that was spoken was, was really so culturally <coughs> affected that there was, there was no real sense that people should think about what's happening in front of them and so think about their lives. The person who was taking the service said basically, well, everyone will all go to heaven. Doesn't matter what you do, doesn't matter where you are, doesn't matter what you believe. Doesn't matter who you follow, God is big enough so that, and Jesus has done enough so that everybody's going to get there anyway. Now, in a sense, let's be honest, that would be lovely if true, wouldn't it? If we could just get on with our lives, do our own thing, you know, just go on, doesn't matter who we, who we hurt, how we treat people, if we could just do our own thing and then go to heaven afterwards, that would be lovely, wouldn't it? Well, no, it wouldn't. But there's a mindset that would think that that's lovely. You know, no accountability. I just do what I want. That would be lovely. But the gospel doesn't say that, does it? Jesus' work on the cross was a work of salvation for all who will repent of their sin and trust in him. It was a provision made by a holy and righteous God for sinners. And the only qualification we need, in a sense, to reach to Christ this morning, is to recognise that we are sinners. But I was sad, in the midst of my own grief, on Wednesday, to think there was no sense of the holiness of God here. That we were gathered together in tragedy and in loss, and in gratitude, in a sense, for some of us. But there was no sense of the reality of who God is. The reality of our plight before him. You know, our plight as, hu as a human beings before God necessitated the sending of his son. Necessitated Jesus to become a human being. Necessitated his perfect life of obedience. It's necessitated his substitutionary death on the cross. All that was necessary. All that is necessary because you and I, even as the children presented here, which I'll talk about in a minute, 
are sinners and are cut off from God. Mark reminds us here of the reality of who Jesus is and the reality of his mission, who he was, who he is, and what he came to do and why. And the why was so, was so missing on Wednesday. Yes, God was spoken of as a God of love and as a God of power, and he is those things. But he is also a God of holiness. He's also a God of supreme righteousness. He's a God who holds the guilty to account. He holds us as his special creation to account. He holds you, if you don't know Christ today, to account for your sins. But he also provides a way of salvation for you today. He provided, he's provided his son, Jesus. All you have to do today, friend, whoever, you, whoever we are, is to trust him. All you have to do today is to run to Jesus, to ask for acceptance. To repent of our sin and to put our faith in him as both Lord and Christ. Wonderfully, it's not rocket science. It's that simple. We just run to Jesus. We ask him to forgive us. We put our faith in what he's done for us and in who he is. And we accept him as Lord and Saviour. Or rather, we ask him to accept us into his family. So that's the nature of this gospel. Also, I want to remind us of the arrangement of this gospel. This, the gospel writer Mark has crafted his material in such a way as to put in a certain order Jesus' actions and words before us to emphasise two or three particular things. We said when we started in chapters 1 to 8, you know, this account centres on one particular thing. It centres on <coughs> Jesus' identity. Who Jesus is. Time and time again, as Jesus heals or delivers someone from sickness or demonic oppression, people say, who is this? Who is this Jesus? The next section, which we're in, which are actually where we're in now, in chapter 10, highlights something else. It highlights Jesus' mission. What he had come to do. What was necessary for him to be the saviour. And it also highlights, which is sometimes the hard bit for us, it highlights the nature of what it means to follow him. It highlights what it means to be a follower of Jesus. What does it mean to be a Christian? Well, Mark tells us. And this section confronts us with a, if you like, a diagnostic tool. Some of us are familiar in our professions with diagnostic tools, aren't we? This section of Mark's gospel presents to us a mechanism for testing our own faith. For asking ourselves, is my faith genuine? Do I really understand who Jesus is? Do I get it? Do I understand why he came? And to assess my response in terms of what we might call the hallmarks of true Christianity. We can ask ourselves the question, and listen, the Lord actually wants us to do this from time to time, to examine ourselves. We can ask ourselves, am I a real Christian at all? But you might wonder, well, what are the defining characteristics of Christianity? What does it mean to be a true Christian? What is this diagnostic tool that Mark gives us? Well, these indicators are here before us. And in our reading and preaching through this gospel, we've seen them for some time. Briefly remind you of Mark chapter 8. What is the, what is the, the mark of a real faith in Jesus? Well, Mark 8 tells us, that it's a clear knowledge of who Jesus is. <coughs> you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. You know, we got, we got Mark's all the intimation of what he thought right at the start of the gospel. The gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. He leaves it to everybody else in the gospel to tell us more about who Jesus is. But the disciples come to the place where they say, you are the Christ. You're not just Moses. You're not just another prophet. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus goes on from there in Mark 8, doesn't he? And he says, 
Well, if that's true, <coughs> then you've got to live your life in a certain way. He frames our following in terms of coming after Jesus. And he says, we've got to deny self. We've got to take up our cross. And remember what the cross was. The cross wasn't a, 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 a piece of jewellery in those days. It is today. In those days it was a, well what was it? It was a means, it was a means of death. It was an instrument of certain death. It was an instrument of execution. Jesus says, take up your cross and follow him. In other words, identify yourself with Jesus so that you and everybody around you knows that you're trying to live your life to follow Jesus. In Mark 9, we also saw some particular ways that being a Christian is described. And we have to give a nod here to the transfiguration, where Jesus himself is transfigured before three of his disciples. And what does Jesus say then? Well, discipleship in Mark 9 is framed as being the last of all, the servant of all. In other words, it's painted as being a life of humility and service. Now that's tough in our culture, isn't it? When what we're, what we're told is to defend ourselves, to stand up for ourselves, to push ourselves forward at every opportunity. Discipleship here is also framed as seriousness against sin. Jesus has spoken to the crowds and said, listen, if your right hand offends you, causes you to sin, cut it off. And remember, Jesus was using hyperbole days. He's not saying cut your hand off or cut your foot off or pull off, poke your eye out. What he's saying is that sin is so serious that if you could do that, it would be worth it. But it's not. You know, the truth of living as a, a, a genuine believer in Christ in our culture, as it has always been, is that we cannot, as Christians, sin with impunity. We cannot. You know, we have to take sin seriously. We cannot sin with impunity because if Jesus has died for us, if he has hung on that cross taking our sin upon himself, then our relationship with sin has changed forever. Because if we're a Christian, we have died with Christ. And he has taken his sins upon us. So we have been raised with Christ. And wonderfully, his, our sins were not raised with us. This marks out so much of our lives. Marks out what we think about. Marks out how we live. Marks out our approach to things that are important in our culture. We saw earlier in Mark 10 how it, how it marks out our, our sexual ethic. And what was that underpinned by? What did Jesus say about us as humans? He said that, he, that we were created male and female. That marriage was given as the only acceptable place for sexual intercourse. We were created, we are accountable. We cannot mess with sin in any of these regards. So these are in a sense the hallmarks. And if you're unfamiliar with that phrase, what is a hallmark, of course, you remember the hallmark is a, is a is something used to stamp, it's usually when an article of value, of gold or silver or platinum, is stamped with a particular mark to testify to its genuineness and its purity. So you might have a ring or a, I don't know, a, a necklace or something, a, 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 a money clip, and, and on there is stamped certain symbols which testify that this money clip, this ring, this piece of jewellery is the real thing. Well friends, if we are real Christians today, there are certain things that have to be stamped on our lives. What has to be stamped on our lives? Well predominantly of course our faith. Our faith in Christ Jesus as Lord and Saviour. And flowing from that all these other attitudes and behaviours, self-denial, humility, Sanctity. All of these things flow from hearts that have been changed by the Lord Jesus. 
Well, in that text today, and I am going to get to it eventually, we have another hallmark. And if I put it this way, it's the hallmark of our helplessness before God. And friends, this is often, in our culture, the hardest thing for us to grasp. Because we will do anything in the whole world except appear helpless before God. And you know how I know that? It's because that every other philosophy, every other way that man has created to present himself before God says that he can do something so that God can see how good he is. There is a way to self-justify, to make yourself worthy before God. And Jesus reminds us here, even as he deals with children, that that has never been the way. The hardest thing for us as, as human beings is to say to God, I'm helpless. I'm hopeless. There's nothing I can do except trust in what you have already done. And that is the hardest thing that Jesus asks of us. And you might think, well, that doesn't sound very hard. Well, I want to, I want to have a, a word about your Christian life. How many times in your Christian life are you worried? And anxious. How many times do you try and do something that, you, that, that, that sort of engineers God's will in your life? But if you're anything like me, thousands of times. Times without number. And the bottom, the bottom line of that is a desire or a notion that I can help myself. That I can in some way present myself and improve myself. But the truth is that we have to receive and keep receiving the kingdom as one who is helpless. So let's have a look at the text very quickly. In this particular text we see a couple of things. Firstly in verse 13 we see another commotion. Well we should be quite used to those uh, in Mark's gospel. There's been lots of contention, lots of controversy. Lots of commotions around Jesus. But here in verse 13 of chapter 10, there's another one. It says, they, and they were bringing children to him that he might touch them. And the disciples rebuked them. You might think, well, what's that about? It's interesting really because usually it's the other people that are the problem around Jesus, isn't it? It's usually like the Pharisees. They come with their questions and their tests. And their judgments, and they look at them and say, Well, you know, who are you to say these things? And that usually causes the controversy or the commotion. But here it's not the Pharisees. You know, Jesus is again, where is he at? He's in Judea, he's traveling towards Jerusalem, and the crowds are still around him. And the contention here arrives because not the Pharisees, but the disciples are keeping children. And the, and the, and the point here is little babies, people who are brought, brought to Jesus by their parents. They are keeping them aware. So in other words, what you have here is another, a further evidence of the disciples' wrong thinking. Now we've seen this before, haven't we? We've seen it in chapter 9. We saw it in their desire to be first. Their desire to be given a platform. Their desire to be the first among equals. Their desire to have the, the spotlight on them. And Jesus shakes his head at them. And he says, that's not the way of this kingdom. If you want to be great in this kingdom, you must be the last. If you want to be great in this kingdom, you must be the servant. You must place others before yourself. But here again, we see evidence, an episode of their wrong thinking. Keep away. Don't bother Jesus with these, with these babies, with these little kids. You know, perhaps they thought that they were helping Jesus out. I often do that. I sometimes think that I'm helping Jesus out. I don't know if you do. I sometimes do. I find myself doing that. But really, what were they doing? Actually, they weren't helping Jesus out at all, as we'll see by his reaction. But really, they were just confirming, they're reinforcing their own priorities and their own prejudices. You are not important enough to meet with Jesus, so go away. Jesus is too important for you, so keep out of our way. We are the ones who will guard who comes to Jesus. 
We are the ones who judge how you dress. We are the ones who judge how important you are as a person. Whether you, you know, whether you've got money or whether you've got a, a nice car or whether you've got, you know, a good family or what your background is. We are the ones who will judge. Now, of course, we live in a very different culture to the first century. As I've said time and time again in this gospel, children, sadly, in the in the Greco-Roman world, were not valued. <coughs> It was common to have, across the Roman world, to have rubbish tips outside your house. Obviously, there were no bin men uh, in those days. A bit like parts of Cumbria, a bit like parts of Allerdale today. There's no bin men. Um, sorry for all you live in, uh, live in Allerdale. Um, but on those, on those rubbish, one of those rubbish heaps was more than just throwing out food and worn out clothes. What you often found in that culture was unwanted children. Babies. <coughs> Abortion wasn't practiced in those days. But exposure was. And it was common that if you, if you had too many children, you would leave your child out to die. And if somebody else wanted a the child, they would literally pick a, pick a baby up off the rubbish heap, take it to be their own. <coughs> and in a sense, part of that culture, part of that discarding of the value of children had seeped in to the whole Roman Empire. Now that's contrary, of course, to the very testimony of Scripture, doesn't it? Psalm 127 tells us about children being a gift and a heritage from the Lord. But to the disciples, it seems, these babies were of no consequence. That's why from chapter 9, when Jesus brought a child in their midst, it was so revolutionary. Would they have regard for the smallest, for the, for the one of least value? So the disciples, perhaps thinking that they were helping Jesus out, just doing, just doing the, the work that Jesus didn't have time for, actually reinforcing their own priorities and prejudice. You know, friends, sometimes, sometimes in our own hearts, as, even as believers, we can think we're serving Jesus and just be reinforcing our own priorities. Remember when we went through the book of Exodus together and we talked about not taking the, the Lord's name in vain. Do you remember that? Now you might have thought then, well I don't, I, don't, I don't swear, I don't take the name of Jesus, I don't use it as a swear word. But remember we said that actually that commandment was much wider than that. It's not putting yourself forward as acting for Jesus when you're not. And that impinges on a lot of what we can do. It can even impinge on how we act amongst ourselves. Where we take, if you like, where we presume, I should say, to speak for Jesus. We've got to be very careful. We've got to be circumspect about how we take the Lord's name in vain. The commotion is the disciples. Keeping people away from Jesus in verse 13 there. But notice what happens in verse 14. We'll notice Jesus' response. He gives them a command and it's, an, it's framed in, in, in an interesting way. He says, verse 14, But when Jesus saw it, he was indignant and said to them, Let the children come to me. Do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of God. Jesus is angry. Actually, the word in, indignant there is actually the only time this word is used in the whole of Mark's gospel. And it, and it means to express anger. It literally does that. It means Jesus is angry. And he's not angry, he's not, he's not angry at others. He's not angry, you know, he's not in the temple yet in, in that sense. He's angry with his own disciples. He's indignant with the, what strange situation it is when Jesus is angry with his own disciples. What a horrible place that must have been. To think you're doing the right thing. And, to, and for Jesus to say, no. That's why, I, I'll be honest, I love the Gospels. Because they present the disciples in a way that I can relate to. Because if we read the, if we read the Gospels and think, oh, those daft disciples, they've got it wrong again. And we don't include ourselves in that. Then we're missing the point. Jesus is indignant with them. He gives them 
a command. He says, let the children come to me. He says, don't hinder them. He, he, wants, he wants these parents to bring these little ones to him in blessing. Now, of course, that was a recognized process to bring your child to be blessed by a teacher or a rabbi in those days. It's, not, it's nothing about infant baptism here. I read a, a good Presbyterian friend's um, sermon on this a while back when he was talking about where Jesus points this to infant baptism. It's got nothing to do with infant baptism. In fact, I want to I argue there's no such thing in the New Testament as infant baptism. There's only one baptism, and that's baptism of believers. And if, you've, and if you're a Christian, and you've not been baptised as a testimony to your salvation, then come and talk to me. We're actually thinking about organising one uh, baptismal service now. So if you've not been baptised by immersion in water, identifying with the death of Christ, and rising with him to newness of life, then that, that's a, that, that is necessary. It's not just optional, it's not just beneficial if you feel like it, and it's a nice warm day outside. It's necessary. But Jesus is not talking about the sprinkling of infants here, but he is talking about access. And he's going to talk about access to him for a particular reason. He's indignant and he says to his disciples, let them come to me. Don't hinder them. Notice what he says. Don't hinder these babies for to them, to such belongs the kingdom of heaven. Now what does he mean there? Does he mean the kingdom of heaven belongs to young people? Well, probably not. Although young people are included, which I'm grateful for being, being young. Does he mean that we, in a sense, have to act like children? To, be, to, to, to enter into the kingdom? Well, that might be something like that in a sense, but we'll see what he says. Thankfully, he explains what he means. Because there's not only the commotion, there's the command. He uses, he uses what's happening around him, he uses the wrong thinking of the disciples, and he uses that as another teaching point. He uses this as a teaching moment, and he says, truly, truly, I say to you, verse 15 there, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. What does it mean then to receive the kingdom of God like a child? And remember, he was not talking about teenagers or preteens. He's not necessarily talking about toddlers. He's talking about babes brought to him in arms. What does it to receive uh, the kingdom of God like one of them mean? Well, I'll tell you what it doesn't mean. It doesn't mean innocence. Because the Bible tells us that, that, we, that, we are, that none of us are innocent. Not even a newborn baby is born innocent. We are shaped in sin. We are all born rebels. Hostile to God even in our infancy. So it's not about innocence. It's not about infancy of childhood. Now listen, there's nothing wrong with talking about the innocence of childhood. It doesn't last long these days. It never did. You know, children can be wonderfully cute and radically corrupt at the same time. And if you're a parent, you know exactly what I mean. You know the one word we never have to teach our child? No. Well, I never had to teach mine anyway. They seem to know it. Michael, go and do this. No. Matthew, go and do that. Haley, go and do that. No. Where did they learn that? Well, they didn't have to learn it. So what is Jesus talking about? He's talking about the helplessness of a baby in arms. Helplessness. He's talking the condition that he's bringing out here in terms of our entry into the kingdom, our place in the kingdom, is not of innocence or worth. It's the fact that we are absolutely helpless. That we cannot get in to the kingdom of God on our own. And do you know how I know that? Well, look at the next section when you get home. We're going to talk next time about a certain rich young ruler who comes to Jesus and says, what, do I, what must I do to inherit eternal life? The point being that you can't inherit it in that sense. Because the prerequisite is helplessness. It's a recognition of our own helplessness before God. And friends, that's not only a condition of entry into the kingdom. It's the condition of being in the kingdom. And what we need to recognise time and time again 
is our helplessness before God. You know, and, that, and that's the thing, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not saying that means we don't have to do anything, we just sit down. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not a let go and let God sort of person. You know, I want us to walk in holiness and pursue it and to, and to grow in Christ and grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus. All those things are necessary. But in terms of our entry and our place in the kingdom, we must know that we, are, that we were helpless and we remain helpless. You know, we talk about, you know, what, it, what do we do as Christians? One of the things we do as Christians is pray, don't we? We pray. Martin Luther called it the, the breath of the Christian, is prayer. Well, what is prayer? Prayer is an example of our helplessness. Because you don't pray for what you can do. If I want a cup of tea after this service, and I probably will, I won't pray about it. I won't go in a corner and start asking the Lord, you know, if he would be gracious enough in his goodness and mercy to, to provide a cup of tea. I'll simply go and ask, because I can do that. But when I'm talking to God about the salvation of others, when I'm talking to God about my own growth in him, when I'm talking about the extension of his kingdom, I have to recognise, we have to recognise that we pray because we are helpless to affect those things. And so we pray. And so we come and we bow the knee and found in the place of prayer. And we pray and we pray and we pray. Why? Because we're helpless. And we need God to act. The condition for entry, friend, is not your background. It's not your strength or power. It's not the amount of work that you can get done as a Christian. It's a statement that you cannot save yourself. That you can only run to Jesus and ask him to save you. Unless we come as a child. Whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child. Unless you, unless, you, unless you receive it as it is. As a gift that you cannot earn. That you cannot be worthy of. Then you shall not enter it. Friends. My plea for us today. Is to recognise again our helplessness. The conclusion of this is there in verse 16. No doubt shamefaced as, as I often am as a disciple of Jesus. The children come to him. And he takes them in his arms. So obviously they're not teenagers. He takes them in his arms and he blesses them. And he lays his hands in other words, there is intimacy of contact and communion with those who enter the kingdom. Friends, you know, one of the blessings we have as being part of the family of God is our access, our communion with the Saviour. Who from out of his grace and power has saved us. Who now even today sustains us and one day will glorify us. May the Lord have his blessing to his word.